Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Staying warm. It's nice and cozy in here. I'm so glad that you braved the cold and the snow to be here together. I look forward to this time we have together every week. Um, Well, you know, it was six years ago yesterday, and I remember that day. I will always remember that day. It was snowing. It was late in the evening, and Dan and I pulled out of a hospital parking lot to drive about 45 minutes back to our house, tucked into the back seat safely in a baby carrier was our son Noah, just about 72 hours old at that point. And Noah's big brother Will was already at home and in bed thanks to his loving grandparents. And there we were, headed home, now officially a family of four, thanks to the miracle of adoption. But we wouldn't be a family of four for very long, not very long at all, because at that moment, I was also eight months pregnant. (laughs) It had just been a few months before that when we received an unexpected call that Will's birth mom was expecting and hoping that she could place that child into our family. We thought about that possibility, uh, knowing that that would mean welcoming two babies at the time when Will would only be 18 months old. That was a little overwhelming for us to think about. Yet, we really had this sense of peace, that this is what God was inviting us to do. And we had this sense of assurance that that God would provide for us all that we needed to walk the journey ahead. And you know, one of the central things for us in feeling like we could say yes and feeling like we could do this thing that we thought God was calling us to do was knowing we already knew that we weren't alone. We had a great church family and a lot of dear friends and we had a Sunday school class and people that we did life together and shared life together. And we knew that these people would come alongside us, that we wouldn't be alone. And let me tell you, they did. After we welcomed Noah, and then five weeks later when Jake was born and things were crazy in our house, man, our church family showed up in ways that still floor me. I have every name written down in a notebook. Almost 40 different people showed up within those first few uh, weeks and months, and they folded laundry and washed bottles and changed diapers and rocked babies and did all the things in the house to help us out, and most importantly, to just sit down with an encouraging word and a listening ear to remind us that we weren't alone and to help us keep our sanity a little bit. As the boys continued to grow up, uh, or just become a few months old, Dan and I were feeling like, we, you know, this is great. We need some people in our lives on a regular basis who are our people that are tracking with us because life is really intense these days. And so we started talking about doing a small group together. But our problem was that with, with having these three little boys all at once, it was really hard to leave the house uh, with them. It was a lot of car seats and a lot of bundling up and trying to get out. So we decided we'll host a small group. And so we had people come to our home and we sat around in the living room and rocked babies while we talked and had some babysitters in the basement for the bigger kids while they would go and play. And these were our people. And together... We were a part of one another's lives, and we were tracking with one another, and and we were checking in on one another and encouraging one another. God provided these people in our lives, these real relationships, and I'm telling you, if it wasn't for that, we couldn't have walked out this story that God called our family to walk. Well, today we're continuing in our series called Small Things, Big Difference. As we think about the small kinds of decisions and habits that over time make a huge difference in the trajectory of our lives. And this week, we want to talk about what happens when we are intentional about the relationships and the community that we have in our lives. 
what happens when we're intentional about not going it alone, but when we have friendships, when we're investing, not just on the surface, but in the real things in our lives, to really love one another. That's what Jesus taught us to do. And that's at, the story, that's at the heart of the story of Jesus. Now, let's think about this uh, life and ministry of Jesus. Let's think about this morning how he came and what he came to do. We know that Jesus came to dwell among us, to enter right into the middle of the mess. And among the symbols of Jesus, we have this image of a manger, of God himself coming in the humblest way we can possibly imagine, in the vulnerable state of a newborn infant and an infant that is laid to sleep in an animal feeding trough. It doesn't get more vulnerable than that. And we have the image of a cross, knowing that as Jesus grew and as his ministry developed, that Jesus came and he moved straight towards the worst kind of human suffering and shame to transform it and to redeem it. The story of Jesus is is unbelievable, and it changes our lives. And when we open the Gospels and we read about the story of Jesus and we think about what Jesus came to do and how he approached his life and and his ministry, we look at that and, and we ask, what were the priorities of Jesus? What did he talk about? What was it all about for him? Now, if you or I were God and thank goodness that we are not, <laughs> but, but I wonder what would our priorities be? If we were to send our one and only son into the world, what would be the things that he should talk about? Well, we might think about uh, what Jesus would want to talk to us about when we think about a vertical line, a relationship between humans and God, that if God is coming to dwell among us, that he would have a lot of instructions for us when we think about this vertical relationship of how we're to relate with God, how we're to think about God, how we pray, how we're to understand the character of God, that if God is among us, these would be central things about what he would have to say to us. And Jesus certainly addressed these things. We certainly learn a lot about this from Jesus. But when we read about the teaching of Jesus, we can find a surprise because that doesn't seem to be the place where he starts. Jesus starts talking about things horizontally. Jesus talks about our relationships with one another how we live in community, how we treat each other, how we understand each other and love one another. For Jesus, it's all about relationships. As Jesus started his ministry, he began by calling disciples to create a community around him of people to share life together. His mission was not one of isolation, But he wanted others to join him and to experience this love of God because these would be the people who are commissioned to go and share that message with the rest of the world. And when Jesus taught, he taught about relationships so much. Last week, we talked about this concept of believing the best, and we spent some time in the Sermon on the Mount, this famous teaching of Jesus in Matthew 5 through 7 where Jesus talks to us about how to live. It's sort of a Jesus value system. And the vast majority of the Sermon on the Mount is about our relationships with others. So you see, when we choose to follow Jesus, while we are making a decision that is represented by a vertical relationship and and we are choosing that he is our Lord and Savior and that we will follow him, Jesus tells us that how we live that out looks like a horizontal line. It's how we live that out with one another. This is the picture of our faith, that we follow Jesus, that we are in relationship with him, and we live it out and experience our faith in the context of our relationships with one another. Now, in John chapter 13, we find some words of Jesus. This is our text today. If you'd like to turn to John chapter 13, beginning at verse 34, you've probably heard these words before. A new command I give you, love one another. 
As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, when we look at where this text falls in the gospel of John, this is at a critical moment. It's between the last supper that has just occurred as he's gathered with his disciples and before the crucifixion. And I always think about that in the gospel of John, and this is that section of scripture that makes me want to lean in and think these are critical things. It's a critical moment where Jesus is speaking things that he wants to make sure that we understand. You know, one of the things that's interesting when we read the gospel of John, the first 12 chapters, the word love is used 12 times. But then once we get to chapter 13, that's when the the disciples gather with him for that Passover meal, the Last Supper. Then between chapters 13 and 21, the word love shows up 44 times. As the stakes go up, as things get critical, as Jesus is leaning in with with a message for his followers, love is what is at the forefront, because love is at the center of it all, and not just loving God, but also loving one another. In fact, did you catch that in the text? Jesus said, by this, meaning how you love one another, by that, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Wow. Do you ever think about that? Stop and really think about that for a moment. How do people know that you are a follower of Jesus? Well, the text says it right here. It's not just because you have chosen to believe a certain thing and chosen to give your life to God. You will be known as a Jesus follower based on how you treat others. That can be a little terrifying to think about sometimes, can't it? But Jesus says it for us right here. When we choose to follow Jesus, he makes it clear that we live out our faith in the context of relationships. Because the truth is, God uses people to form people. God uses people to form people. This is where the rubber meets the road in our faith, where we're tested and refined Just as we talked about last week, do we assume the worst or believe the best? What's it like as we live out our faith? You know, have you ever thought to yourself, I would be so much more loving towards people if people just weren't so ridiculous? Have you ever thought that to yourself? You know, we want to be loving people. We want to be people that represent Jesus and people that we interact with. But then we go out into the world. And have you noticed? People are difficult to love. Have you noticed this? They're challenging and annoying and sometimes rude. One of my friends once said to me, I've met people. They're not that great. (laughs) I think there's a temptation for all of us that sometimes when we think about our faith, we'd rather just withdraw and think, this is really just about me and God. I'm just going to hunker down and, and just make this between me and God because it gets messy. And when I interact with people, that's when I lose my temper and that's when not the best part of me comes out when I'm driving in my car. But if we do that, if we isolate ourselves, if we act as if our faith is only between us and God, then we're missing what Jesus has called us to do and what it means to live out our faith as we follow Jesus. Jesus said it in another way in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus was asked by uh, some of the rule followers, what's the greatest commandment that there is? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You see, your relationship with God is not just between you and God. Your relationship with God is inseparably linked into the context 
of community. And while your faith may be personal, it is not private. Now, I'll be honest. I think that's a tough message for us, where we live in, as Americans in this time in history and in this space and the way that our culture challenge, or, uh, kind of ingrains in us to think about individualism. I think that's a hard message for us. We know how to be consumers. We know how to think about what's, what's best for ourselves and to think about leading our lives on our own. And so it's natural for us to think about our faith in a similar kind of way, that it's just my walk with God. It's my spiritual needs. It's about who I am and what I choose to do. But when we choose to follow Jesus, he tells us that it's an inward transformation and there's an outward expression of how we choose to live it and that we cannot separate these things. So what does that mean for us? If that's true, then what does that mean for us to, to live out this horizontal aspect, this one another aspect in the way that God invites us to do? Well, I would say today that, that the point of this is not to just be around people, not just to be present with people, not just to show up in a crowd, but that what Jesus is actually inviting us to do is to have a particular kind of relationship in community with others. And Jesus describes, and the scripture describes for us, that it is good when we are together together. Jesus modeled that with his disciples as they began to follow him. And the early church lived this out as they gathered and began to understand what it meant to follow Jesus together. We find evidence of it in the way that Paul poured out his heart in the letters that he wrote in the epistles to the early followers of Jesus that he loved. Good things happen when we are in great relationships with one another. Isn't that true for you? Can you think of a time in your life when you think of a, a group of people that you were in relationship with and you think, boy, those were good days. Can you think of that? Maybe it was in school with some friends that you had or some roommates that you had. Uh, maybe it's some of your church friends around here. Maybe it's with some coworkers that you have now or had in the past. Can you think of those people, your people, the people who know you, who have your back, who know the real you. It's so good when we have those relationships in our lives. There's so much life and joy and fullness that we find there. But what I want to ask you today is, are you intentionally making space right now, these days in your life, for some Jesus-centered relationships? Is that part of your life these days? Not just coming to church on Sundays, but, but to actually know one another, to share life together. In the Old Testament, we, there's a really cool description of the blessing of community. I'd like for us to look at that for a moment uh, this morning. It's in Psalm 133, uh, which is one of the shortest psalms that we find. It's only three verses long. Psalm 133 says, how, <clears throat> how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is, if, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Verse 1 says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. That reminder that there is good stuff there when we are together in relationship with one another. And that when we are in unity, and unity as a reminder does not mean uniformity. It does not mean we are identical to one another, but it means that we are drawn together and we are united by a common purpose, by a common God. David, who wrote this psalm, wanted to illustrate for us how good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity. And so he uses these two examples of how good it is. 
First, he says, it's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. We read a statement like that, and that probably raises a lot of questions for us, doesn't it? Who is Aaron, and what does he do to deserve being doused with oil? I don't know how you have this picture. Is it like the Gatorade moment over a coach's head, you know? I mean, what, what's going on here in the text? What's this all about? Well, Aaron, which it's a great name, isn't it? I'm just going to say that. Different spelling, but great name. Um, Aaron is the younger brother of Moses in the Old Testament. He serves alongside Moses. And the Bible tells us that after the Israelites are delivered from slavery in Egypt, God is teaching them how to live as people of God. And he gives them various instructions. And one of those instructions is that they are to consecrate Aaron and his sons as high priests. We find that in Exodus 29 and 30. And Oil, which was a very common everyday element uh, necessary for all the routines of life, yet there were very specific instructions uh, given to the people to make sacred anointing oil. And that sacred oil would be used to mark things as holy, as things that are set apart. So these common elements of oils and spices would come together, the the recipe we can find in the scripture, and they would be put together in a particular way so that it would become something holy. And we have this image of this oil being being, uh, put over Aaron's head and, and running down so much, so wonderful that it would be onto the collars of his robe. Aaron, one who was loved and and marked with oil, this intentional element which resulted in transformation. You know, I think that that's a great picture for us because community is much like that. It's common elements. Just as Aaron was a regular human being and oil and the spices that were mixed with it were ordinary and common elements, but when they came together in the way in which God intended, something beautiful, something holy happened. And in the same way, in in our lives, some really ordinary kinds of things can happen. When we have community together, when we get together and we show up in a living room, a very ordinary place, and we eat normal kinds of food, and we laugh about bad jokes, and hang out with one another, and and form friendships, these very normal, ordinary things can actually become something holy and something sacred. These ordinary things can be good and full of life. There are other places in the scripture that talk about the way that we come together in community in very ordinary kinds of way. Uh, In Acts 2, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And Romans 12 said, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And in 1 Corinthians 12, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you a part of it. This kind of community, this kind of community that that God longs for us to have isn't, isn't a matter of following a certain formula in order to create it. The truth is it it only happens by the gracious hand of the Lord. But our task is to be faithful and to be available to, to show up and then to ask God to work. And remember, David gives us two examples here of how good and pleasant it is when we come together in unity. The first is a reminder that it's ordinary elements that come together. And the second is a reminder that it only happens by the grace of God. It says, it's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Hermon is a mountain range that's Uh, north of the Sea of Galilee. And it was this dominant visual background with these beautiful snowy summits that the people would know well. Mount Hermon is this source of great blessing for the surrounding areas because of the refreshing breezes and the great reservoirs and the magnificent springs that are present because of it. 
Herman received about 60 inches of precipitation every year. And so melting snow is a main source of life for the Jordan and the rivers that water the area. Herman is known as a place of abundant dew. Herman's this life-giving place. And, and the scripture says it's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, which is in Jerusalem, which is a sacred place of life and blessing. But that place is 120 miles away much too far to actually be touched or influenced by Mount Hermon. And so we have this picture in the scripture of something awesome that's happening. Oh, Mount Hermon, that wonderful place, but it's too far to touch Zion, to touch Jerusalem. See, something like that, what's described in the scripture, that's a miracle kind of thing. That can only happen because of the gracious touch of God. And so it is with community. While there are ordinary things that happen, there are also things that remind us that when we get together, when we share life together, when we allow people to really know us and see us, something happens. That God meets us in those spaces because that's the very thing that God longs for and intends for us to experience in the presence of one another. And there is something that happens when we gather together that is only the gracious hand of God. This combination of life-giving relationships and the sacred touch of God's presence. God's presence, not in a place like Zion, but in a person of Jesus Christ. The scripture talks about the way that God's presence is at work in community. Ecclesiastes 4 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. In Matthew 18, Jesus said, For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. And Psalm 133, as it ends, it says, For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. You know, that's great news for us today, to know that our God has commissioned us as followers of Jesus to live that out and to experience that in the context of relationship, to love God and to love one another, and that everything is built on those two things, and that God wants that good and pleasant, that life-giving experience right at the heart of our lives. And so I wonder, what does that look like in your life today? What does it look like for you to be in community and in relationship? And that's not just a question for us here today. Also, hello to those who are watching online. It's a question for you as well. What does it look like for you to have those core relationships in your life, those intentional friendships that are centered around Jesus Christ? Today, I want to invite you to think about a very specific step. Starting in February, as Pastor Ben talked about uh, earlier in the service, we're going to start an all-church journey together. And I'm telling you, I am so excited about this, I can hardly stand it. I believe that God's going to do some awesome things in our midst. Because the truth is, every one of us has areas of our lives where we need to experience greater freedom. Because every one of us has, we have those things that weigh us down or hold us back. Sometimes those things that we don't even think about them very much because we become so comfortable living with them. But you see, we serve a God who longs for us to have free and abundant life. And that means he helps us to identify places in our lives where he wants to do a good and a new work. So together, we're going to be on this journey for six weeks together to be on this quest to be truly free. Now, as part of this, we're asking everyone in the life of the church to do three things. The first one is to gather, to be here on Sunday mornings, to be here for worship and teaching. Second, to work through a guide, which is a personal journal that we'll provide for you uh, to work through throughout the six weeks. And the third thing is we're asking everyone in the church just for six weeks to be in a group, 
to be in a small group, a group that will meet in a home or perhaps a nearby restaurant or coffee shop where you will gather with the same group of people for six weeks and share life together and have some fun and cool and meaningful conversations. We're asking everyone to do that just for six weeks. And just like most things in our lives that really matter and really make a difference, it only happens if we make some time and space and make it a priority. Today, after the service, we have groups uh, signing up and, and getting going. So Pastor Ben and I will be out in the hallway, and there's the bulletin board. You can sign up today for a group that works for your schedule and your availability, and we'll add more groups in the days to come. In fact, maybe you want to help host a group. We'd love to talk with you about that. I believe that God has some great things in store for us. And maybe you're at a point in your life where you know you want to take that next step to be connected with others and know others and make some more friends and share life together. This is an easy, low-pressure kind of way to do that, just for six weeks to give it a try. It's a small thing that makes a big difference to pause and, and to think about where you are in your life and how you might take that next step. Today, I encourage you, not only to think about that in your own life, but I would encourage you to think about that as you see one another. We all see people in our lives every day who might be lonely or might be isolated. We all have that opportunity to help others and to invite them and encourage them. So as you're thinking about what this looks like in your life, invite someone to join you to be a part of it. As we all know, that invitation can make all the difference. You know, I am so grateful that God designed it this way, that it's not just a journey of isolation between me and God, but to know that, that he invites me to be on a journey with others, that we get to do this together and to help one another along the way. What a good and gracious God we serve. Will you pray with me? Our gracious God, we thank you so much for the way that you love us, for the way that you have designed for us to follow you. God, I thank you for our church family, and I thank you, God, for the way that you invite us to share life together, not just worship, but to know one another and, and to uh, share friendship with each other. So God, I pray for each of us today that you would help us as we take those steps, as we think about what community looks like in our lives and God, I pray that you would give us the courage to respond and obey. And God, I pray that you would help us to have our eyes wide open, to notice others who feel isolated or alone and who need to know that they are loved and that they belong. Help us, God, to help others in that way. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the way that you love us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.